Okay, uh, so today we're gonna to be going over chemical competition control. Uh, we already talked about mechanical site prep a few weeks ago. And one of the objectives of mechanical site prep is competition control. But as we saw with some of that data, it's far less effective than chemical competition control. And so while there are our societal factors that are gonna be pretty important with herbicides, um, it's probably uh, one of our more controversial silvicultural tools uh, right up there with clear cutting. Uh, we're not gonna get into that a, a ton today, but you can see there's different local and state regulations around the world. There's lawsuits ongoing uh, for some of these active ingredients that we'll be looking at. Um, and then there's of course folks moving into, you know, sort of organic farming, things like that because uh, they don't like uh, these tools that we have. So, uh, so be aware of that, but we're not gonna get into that in great detail today. Uh, really what we're gonna talk about is primarily the ecology, but also sort of the operations really more than the economics of herbicide application. Now we'll see a lot of our herbicides are applied during the establishment phase of a prescription, uh, but we also apply them intermediate in the middle of a rotation. So uh, this lecture could have really gone in either place. So we're covering it here with intermediate treatments. And then what we're gonna see is herbicides are generally most commonly used in intensive silvicultural systems. So they're most commonly used in our plantation forests. We can use them in extensive silvicultural systems um, if there's a specific application. So for example, we often have hardwood stands being managed for water quality or uh, wetland mitigation banking credits um, under the Clean Water Act, uh, where you have undesirable species like Chinese tallow, and they may be doing hack and squirt operations, controlling those out in a hardwood stand to improve the quality of that ecosystem. So they're tools that can be used anywhere, but it's most commonly gonna be with intensive plantation forests. So let's start out, uh, you all can work in groups and we're gonna see herbicides are pretty complex, um, but in your groups, go ahead and come up with the top five things you think you'd wanna know before applying herbicides to a site being managed for hardwoods. Then do the same thing for pines and see how your lists are the same or different. Uh, in a normal semester, we would then write that up on the board, but I don't think it's all gonna fit on our tiny board here. Um, so we'll just sort of go over it after you all have come up with your list. So. Take a few minutes and work on that. Okay, so what are some of the factors uh, for a hardwood stand that you're gonna wanna know? So type of herbicide, preferred species. So is it near an SMZ? Yeah. For some of them, soil type's gonna matter. For others, it may not be as important, but yeah. So what are your objectives? Right? Yeah, so the hydrologic regime could be important on a site. Yeah, so adjoining properties. So um, is it a neighbor? Um, do they have some sensitive land use that your herbicide application might impact? Um, of course, if there were drift, you definitely want to avoid drift. Any drift is going to be illegal. So drift is just the herbicide moving off your property onto somebody else's property. So um, Texas Department of Agriculture regulates that and will do investigations um, in our state, and of course, it often leads to litigation as well. So what else? So why are you applying the herbicide? So you need to know what your weed species are, right? So you need to define your weed. You need to define your crop. Um, your crop is going to be critical, right? The last thing you want to do is control your crop tree, right? Um, that would be the opposite of what you're trying to do with an herbicide application. So, um, so it sounds like you all came up with some pretty good lists. Uh, were they similar or different for pines compared to hardwoods? Okay, well, why don't you know your crop species with hardwoods, Greg? You took dendro. Right, but it, it would be defined. You would know when you were applying, right? So, yeah. Um, but the point with hardwoods is you do have a mixture. So hardwoods, I mean, how many stands have you been out in around here that are hardwood dominated that have just one species at 90% or more? We just typically don't see that. Um, in our pine plantations, they can be pure stands, 90% or more, one species of pine. So just the fact that it's a mixture, we're gonna see that throughout the rest of the semester, um, those mixed stands become much more complicated to manage. Uh, but really the list may not be too different between these two different scenarios. So I think we already hit uh, pretty much most of the high points on this slide. Um, and so one thing we didn't mention as much was the type of prescription in terms of when you're applying. 
So a site prep herbicide application is applied before the crop trees are present on the site. So you apply it prior to tree planting. A release is applied over the top of the crop trees. And so you've applied it after those crop trees are planted. And then remember, we went over a, a very narrow pre-commercial thinning definition of a timber stand improvement or TSI. But I also mentioned there's a broader use of that term typically. And one of the broad uses is herbicide application in a mid-rotation forest. Um, but then we got a lot of the site-specific factors that you would be focused on. Um, timing is going to be important. Are we mixing this herbicide with other herbicides? So we're we using a tank mix. Um, and then we also want to think about the weather. So talked about flooding on a site, uh, but is there, are there other weather conditions that are going to be a factor with our herbicide applications and their efficacy? Yeah, so wind will increase drift and over a certain wind speed, you really can't apply uh, from a helicopter because drift is much too high of a risk. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're applying a herbicide that's uptaken by the roots, are there times of year when you can't do that application? Yeah, so a drought, right? If you have drought conditions and there's just no way, you'll put out 10 to 15 gallons of total spray volume per acre typically. And that's spread over a 200 by 200 foot area. That's approximately an acre of land. So it's really just a fine mist. So if that mist goes out on really dry soil, there's just no way that's getting into the roots. So you need adequate soil moisture for a soil active herbicide. Um, for a foliar active herbicide, you know, applying a month from now probably is not a good idea, right? Uh, if there's no leaves out there, it probably will not be very effective. So how many layers of vegetation are, are out there? Um, if you're looking at a pasture that was abandoned 15 years ago, there may be a lot of vegetation out there that you're trying to control. And so if you just put, again, 10 gallons out per acre, it may not get down to the lower levels of the foliage there. Uh, you may need to go send a skitter out there and have it apply 20 gallons an acre uh, just so it can penetrate through there. Helicopters can only apply, you know, so many gallons per acre because the way you apply more is often by slowing down. But if a helicopter slows down too much, you know, they don't hover as well as you see on TV, right? So uh, it becomes a little less safe. So uh, you can go with a heavier application typically with a skitter on the ground. So, and then, then we talked about impact on other surrounding resources. So hopefully everyone aced that quiz and got the definition of pesticide, but here's another simple way to describe a pesticide. It's a substance for preventing, destroying, or repelling any pest, okay? The common mistake most of us make is in our minds, we make pesticides synonymous with insecticides, okay? But that is not the case. An insecticide is one type of pesticide where that pest is now an insect. So pesticides include insecticides, rodenticides, algicides, fungicides, herbicides. All we're doing is changing the taxa of pests that we're describing. So with an herbicide, the, the pest is specifically a weed and a weed could be any plant. It's just a plant that's somewhere that we do not want it to be. So it has nothing to do whether it's native, non-native, invasive, exotic, nothing to do with any of that. Any plant can be a weed if you don't want it on a particular site. So can loblolly pine be a weed in a loblolly pine plantation? Yeah. It can be, right? So if we've tried to plant out our 554 trees per acre that have been genetically improved and we selected the genetics on them just for this site and for our landowner objective, we talked about all last week how important density was, right? We've got the density we want. We've selected that density for a reason. But if you have an adjacent mature pine stand that seeds in another thousand pines per acre, that's a problem. Now you have crop pines and weed pines. So they can fix this issue with a broadcast application of herbicide, but it sounds kind of counterintuitive, right? Because if it's the same species, any chemical that's gonna kill the volunteer pines is also gonna kill uh, the crop pines. So based on what we looked at on that last slide, is there a way you can do a broadcast application and control volunteer pines, but not crop pines? There is a way. So if you think about it, we can impact timing, right? We can control the timing of our application. So what you would typically see done is they would attempt to do a site prep application. So you have all your young pines seeding in from the adjoining stand. You spray over the top of them about 128 ounces per acre of glyphosate, a high rate of glyphosate. It kills all the volunteer pines. Then you plant your crop pines. So it controls your weed pines because your crop pines were not present on the site yet. Then you plant them once that foliar active herbicide 
um, you know, just takes a few days where it's no longer active out there, right? So, um, so you plant them after. Of course, if you had volunteer pines come in again, then you have to come up with some other method where it may be, you know, a targeted application, uh, a manual removal, something like that, because you can't spray over the top again. So, so weed is some plant somewhere we don't want it to be. Okay, so there's a lot of complexity with herbicides. So I want to start here because we're really only talking about six chemicals. And I'm going to reference these six different chemicals throughout the day. This, these are the names of the active ingredients on each of those columns. And so we're really just talking about six active ingredients. These active ingredients are each combined with other active ingredients or alone in dozens and dozens and dozens of different products. So if you see a product name, Many of these products are now generic. These have rolled off of patent because they were uh, developed so long ago that there are a whole bunch of generics available on the market and new generics coming out all the time. So when you hear a certain product name that you're not familiar with, get a label, look at the label. One of the first things listed is the active ingredient. And then all of a sudden, you know, hey, we're talking about glyphosate. I know what glyphosate does. So you need to know the active ingredients because you can look at the label for a product and just say, well, that's the active ingredient. I know what this is and I know what this does. Um, and so on the rows, I have different uh, trees and herbaceous vegetation listed. And what it's showing is red is giving you good control, red is dead, green, uh, that taxa is not susceptible to that particular chemical. So you're not going to get much mortality. This same table is in the useful handouts packet and I put letters on each cell. So if you can't see the red and green apart, uh, you can look in there and you have that same information available. So. Um, so let's, let's work through each of these six chemicals and uh, go over them in a little bit of detail. So as we're going through the rest of the day, you know, I'll be referring to these over and over and over again. These six chemicals make up about 95% of our applications in forestry. You have some other more minor herbicides, 2,4-D and atrazine that are used in specific cases, but this is most of what we're talking about. So hexazinone on the far left there, um, the most common trade name people know for it is Velpar. This used to be our go-to site prep herbicide prescription. Uh, you would put Velpar out to give you, you can see it's broad spectrum. It controls a lot of different things. It doesn't quite kill them, but it controls them. We don't use Velpar as much anymore. We don't use hexazinone as much anymore because it's soil active and you need to know the soil texture because the application rate varies by soil texture. And if you don't know your soil texture or it's not uniform on a site, you can actually get drift below ground where you will see it move down into the SMZs and all of a sudden you have a lot of trees in your SMZs dying because it moved below ground down to those SMZs. So just because of the complexity of needing to know your soil texture, it's not used very commonly anymore. Still a good option, but just be aware of that soil texture. The next column is triclopyr. The most common product that people know for triclopyr is gonna be garlon. And so you can see Triclopyr is a very broad spectrum herbicide. It kills just about everything. It doesn't seem to give us much control on grass, but pretty much everything else it gives good control on. It is foliar in its activity, so it's gonna be uptaken through the foliage. It's one of the few chemicals that gives us any hope of controlling Yopon, so it's commonly used in prescriptions on Yopon. Um, it's often used in hack and squirt operations where it can be, um, you know, take a little spray bottle like this right here, Hack the stem with a hatchet, spray a few little sprays down into that incision and get it into the cambium. Um, it can also be used as basal bark sprays. And in that case, it'll often be mis mixed with bark oil or basically diesel. It's illegal to go spray diesel out on a site, but if there's a labeled herbicide that diesel is mixed with, then it becomes legal. So, um, so triclopyr, you need to be aware it'll break down in light. So storage is gonna be important and you don't wanna put in a prescribed burn right after you apply triclopyr because it can volatilize and then you'll basically have an herbicide smoke uh, moving to potentially not your property or to an adjoining stand you own and you get unintended control there. So um, triclopyr, I'll show you toxicities too. Triclopyr is also the most toxic of these chemicals. Uh, so you need to be more careful in terms of human safety. Um, Amazapyr is going to be our most common site prep application for woody control. So it took over the role of hexazinone. So it is now our most commonly applied site prep woody control option. 
you can see it also gives broad spectrum control. And then right in the middle there, pines are not susceptible to triclopyr. And so this is what, or sorry, to amazapyr. This is why it's so popular uh, nowadays. Um, it's popular because you can put it out, you can plant pine after, and it's not gonna control the pines. Now, if you apply a high rate and put pine out the next day, you could get some control on your pines. So it's not that pines are completely immune to it. Uh, it will have some impact. If you apply a release application of amazapyr, you can only go to so high a rate without dinging up your pines a little bit. So amazapyr is soil active and it'll also give you some herbaceous weed control. So it's a pretty popular product. Um, Arsenal and Chopper are the two most common trade names people know about for amazapyr. Glyphosate is probably the one herbicide on this list everyone had heard of before coming into class, right? If you've used Roundup, Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. Um, Accord is the common forestry product people have heard of that uses glyphosate. But again, there's a bunch other with all these. Glyphosate gives you pretty broad spectrum control. It does really well on herbaceous things, grasses. Um, if you've ever used Roundup around your yard, it's very easy to kill your turf grass with it um, if you overspray some weeds a little bit. So uh, it's foliar in its activity and it tightly absorbs to clay in the soil. So once it gets in the soil, it does not move, okay? Um, there's only two cases where you tend to find glyphosate in streams. One, you apply glyphosate to the stream, or two, you have erosion on your site and sediment that glyphosate has bound to has gotten into the stream. So other than that, we really do not see it moving. It is not absorbed through the roots. Um, you will see some individual stem methods with glyphosate, hack and squirt, and so it can be used for that. Isn't, isn't glyphosate uh, not active in your soil though? Like, isn't it is not active? soil active. It tightly binds to clay, so it cannot be uptaken by the plant. Um, it's absorbed through the leaves or through the twigs or uh, can be in, you know, done with a hack and squirt operation uh, to get into the cambia. Yeah. But yeah, well, you're right. Glyphosate does not move through the soil. It is not uptaken by the roots. Um, so far, amazapyr and hexazinone are the two we've discussed that are soil active. Um, the final two sound alike, metsulfuron and sulfmeturon, but they're completely different chemicals. Um, so metsulfuron, now we see a more targeted chemical. It is not broad spectrum, unlike the first four that we discussed. And metsulfuron, the most common trade name people are aware of is escort. And so you never see anyone going out and applying just metsulfuron. Um, metsulfuron is almost always in a tank mix with other herbicides. So an escort goes along with something, right? Um, and so you can see it's filling holes in the spectrum of control of some of these other products. If you've got a lot of blackberry, elm, or cherry on your site, and some oaks you're having difficulty controlling, you might add metsulfuron to the tank mix to help handle those. So for folks that do a lot of timber cruising, they appreciate it when the foresters are using metsulfuron you get a lot less blackberry and rubus in your stands. So um, metsulfuron also works pretty well on vines. So it helps control vines if you've got grape vines or other vines that are problematic. And then our sixth chemical, sulfmetron, the most common trade name people are aware of is oust. And this is your primary herbaceous weed control product. Um, we're applying sulfmetron on pretty much almost all our prescriptions for herbaceous weed control. And you can see that's really almost all it's doing. It's sitting grasses, broad leaves, and giving you decent control on legumes as well. It is soil active. You cannot apply it to water and you don't want to apply it before you do any sort of mechanical site prep because you need it evenly distributed across the site for it to be effective. Um, you can use sulfmetron to release planted oak seedlings from herbaceous competition. Um, the trick is there, oaks are susceptible to it. I know that box is green. It typically won't kill them, but if you put it on seedlings, it'll bang them up. They'll get some, you know, pretty poor form uh, for a while as they respond to that. So you can put a rate of two to four ounces of oust out over planted oaks if they are dormant. Okay, if they have not bro broken bud, if they are dormant, uh, you can do that application. Often around here, we don't have that application window on many of our sites because you can't apply it to water. So by the time the sites aren't flooded anymore and water is off our bottom land sites, the oaks have already broken bud. And so in many years, there's no application window for that prescription around here. 
So, so any, any questions on those six chemicals? Yeah, Chris. Um, sulfuron, I believe, is foliar, uh, but I'll need to double check that. Uh, again, that's one we're not applying very often anymore. You only apply a couple ounces an acre, but it's really expensive. So what most folks have sort of moved to is, yeah, there's going to be blackberry in our stand, but that's fine. Um, so it's really where you're going to have an elm problem that you would see deployed more commonly. But yeah, let, let me double check on that. I believe it's foliar, but I'm not 100% on that. Yeah, Will? You said sulfuron is used in almost all applications? Sulfmetron is going to be, so, so a boilerplate prescription is a fall application of a mazapir, and you may also need triclopyr or glyphosate, depending on the scenario. Um, and then a spring application of sulfmetron uh, to give you that herbaceous weed control. Because if you kill the grass in the fall, grass is an annual crop. You didn't fix your problem because it had already dropped seed and you're gonna have different grass in the spring. So you put this one out, it's a pre-emergence. You put it out before that grass even really starts growing. And when it starts germinating and hitting that layer you've got out across the soil, it hits it and it kills it. So it's killing those annual plants as they begin germinating. So it's a pre-emergent herbicide. Um, you can't just tank mix all of these. Um, sometimes like, I mean, if you look at triclopyr and glyphosate, you know, if you try to tank mix those and they're both giving you broad spectrum foliar control, um, they might actually have antagonistic effects and work against one another. So you can't just come up with any possible tank mix uh, because sometimes mixing them together makes each of them less effective and it has the opposite effect you would think it would have. So, yeah, any other questions? So, so how, you, you just kind of do it off of like, habits that like you, you see already? Like, I mean, yeah, so you, you can talk, so uh, you'll be buying these herbicides from someone, uh, from a company. And so the dealers will have information for you on any antagonistic effects and they can point you away from the wrong tank mix. Um, so that, that's one option. You can find that information on the labels um, often the labels will give you information on tank mixing. And then some of these tank mixes, I'll show you some products in a moment, they come pre-mixed. So it's already two or more of these active ingredients in one labeled product. And so then you just have to follow the label. Yeah. So herbicides sound really complex, but we're really only talking about six different products here. We're not anticipating a bunch of new herbicides becoming available for forestry. We've had these chemicals, most of them since the 80s or so. Um, and basically what's going on, if you look at agriculture, we have more agricultural land than forest land under intensive management. So there's more ag land and we're applying much more frequently on that ag land. You're applying once or maybe even multiple times a year in row crop agriculture. In forestry, we're talking about maybe on average an application once a decade. So we're talking about a couple applications to get it established and maybe one mid rotation. So we're not talking about a ton of application here. So for that reason, forestry is a very, very small market for the large companies that are producing these chemicals. And so it costs a lot of money to get a new chemical tested um, and put through the EPA registration process. And so we're not really anticipating a bunch of new products coming out labeled for forestry. In fact, we're seeing the opposite. Some of these products I'll talk about today, um, they're actually have gone off the market. The companies are no longer manufacturing them. The other thing we're seeing is consolidation. Um, so it used to be half a dozen large companies producing these herbicides, but they've basically merged down into just a handful, you know, two or three small company or large companies left today. You know, Monsanto would be one example. So um, you don't have as many companies out there producing these either. Okay, so that was the active ingredients, but then you'll mix them with either water or an oil, depending on whether they're water soluble or they need to be dissolved in oil to apply. So again, for oust, you may be putting out two, four, six ounces per acre, fluid ounces per acre. That's not much. Um, if it's a powdered product, a dry product, that ounces might be weight. So you gotta be careful with ounces, right? But, but you're not putting out much and you're spreading that over an acre. So imagine taking you know, a 12 ounce soda can or you know, a little water bottle like that and spreading that liquid evenly over a 200 by 200 foot area. It's not much, but then you're mixing it with you know, 10 to 15 to 20 gallons of either water or seed oil. Often we'll see MSO, methylated seed oil use. So it's a vegetable oil um, and that's what you're spraying out. But along with the active ingredient, the labeled product, you often use adjuvants as well. 
And I don't have a table for you on the attributes because there are thousands of these. Um, the, the companies that manufacture them will make all sorts of claims. These are not EPA registered products. So um, you just need to be a smart consumer when you're purchasing these. Some of these are very straightforward. Um, if you wanna see where you've applied already, sometimes you'll add a dye to them. So you can see you've already sprayed over here because the vegetation's blue or something. So it might be a dye. Um, you know, these days uh, with COVID around, we're pretty sensitive about drift, right? Of respiratory secretions. Well, drift is the same for herbicides, right? If you have finer, smaller droplets coming out of that helicopter, they're more likely to be able to drift further. They've been aerosolized. And so you might have adjuvants that you add that make the droplet size larger so that it's not gonna hang in the air and drift as far potentially. Um, you'll have thickeners, um, you'll have compatibility agents that help deal with specific antagonisms. You may have products that ex extend the efficacy of one of the active ingredients. So there are adjuvants you can add to apply sulfmetron out in the fall that will make it more effective the following spring. So you can do one application where you put maybe your amazapir and your sulfmetron both out in the fall and save on a second application cost. Um, there's defoamers that just help you mix some of these chemicals together. You know, mixing can be a challenge. And then there's a broad category called surfactants. And surfactants are surface active agents. And so they're gonna attempt to give you better control by manipulating the surface tension of water. And so if you imagine spraying just water out of a spray bottle and you put it out on the table here in front of you, you're gonna see droplets forming because water has a lot of hydrogen bonding. So it has high surface tension. And what you'll see is those droplets form and coalesce and much of the table in front of you is not covered by actual contact with that water that you've sprayed out. So imagine this table's a leaf now, and instead what you did is you mix something in. Um, it could be soap as an example, something that cuts the surface tension, okay? So it reduces the surface tension that water has. Now you spray it out and those droplets flatten and spread more. Imagine spraying an oil out instead of a water, right? They flatten and spread more and you get more contact. So if that table is instead of a table of leaf, now the herbicide is covering more of it and it's more capable of being absorbed into that leaf. And so that's what surfactants are doing. They're reducing the surface tension so that you get better uptake for foliar active herbicides, better coating. And that can be real important for species like yopon that have that waxy leaf where it's gonna be real hard to get it in there. Yeah, Will. Well, you said that sometimes you'll spray out herbicide with like seed oil. Mm -hmm. Is that an, an oil or is you may not need a surfactant in that particular mix, right, um, if you're using an oil. And so uh, the herbicide will be labeled for what you mix it with, whether it's water or an oil, and that'll depend on whether it's ionic or non-ionic. Basically, will it dissolve um, in that solvent or not? And so the, the label will give you guidance on what you mix it with. Um, and again, with triclopyr, sometimes you're mixing it with essentially diesel, bark oil. Um, so you'll, you'll mix them with all sorts of different things, yeah. Okay, so that was a little bit on adjuvants and surfactants, but again, those are not regulated by the EPA. Those are, you know, lots of different products out there. So, okay, we've already been talking and thinking about mode of action. How does it get into the plant? And there's our three modes again. It goes in the leaves, it goes through the roots, it gets absorbed through the cambium or the stem, okay? We can't control that. We have zero control over the size and waxiness and thickness of the cuticle on a yopon leaf. We cannot control that. We can't control when black gums leaves fall off the tree. So we're not able to control anything about the plant, but we can control a lot about our herbicide application. What chemicals do we put out? At what rates? When do we put them out? And how do we select them so that they work in our specific stand? And the whole reason that we're doing all of this is to increase production. So here's our current annual increment annual growth in cubic feet per acre per year. So again, that 400, ton, 400 cubic feet per acre per year line, that's about 12 tons per acre per year, right? Three tons per 100 cubic feet. And so if we could get up to that, we'd be really, really happy as a mean annual increment. Here you see this as current annual increment, so it's actually exceeding it for a brief period during uh, peak production there. And so herbicides are one of the most important tools we have to go from sort of old school, hands-off, low-intensity silviculture 
to very intensive silviculture that's going to grow trees very quickly, uh, produce a lot of volume, and hopefully make the landowner a lot of money. And it's remarkable how effective uh, these chemicals are. Woody control is one of the most important things we can do in an entire rotation. And this data shows you why. This is a pretty remarkable study because you can see there's a pretty good correlation there between the Y and the X axis. But what's re remarkable is the ages those axes represent. So in this study, you had hardwood density and trees per acre at age three on the X axis. So there's your be beginning of the rotation woody competitors. The Y axis is pine basal area and square feet per acre at age 27. So there's your stocking of pine at the end of the rotation. And what you'll notice is a strong relationship where if you look at a hundred or sorry, a thousand hardwood trees per acre at age three, you only have a hundred square feet per acre of pine base layer at the end of the rotation. That's a mixed pine hardwood stand. If you go 2000 hardwood stems per acre or over at age three, by the end of the rotation, you have a mixed hardwood pine stand. Okay, that stand has less than 50 square feet per acre of pine basal area. So really you have to go 500 hardwood stems per acre or less at age three, which you achieve with an application of a product like amazapir, glyphosate or triclopyr. And that's gonna give us a decent pine stand at the end of the rotation. And again, basal area is gonna be pretty closely correlated to volume, right? So you're gonna have a high pine volume in that stand. So without those applications, we're just not, we're not getting a pine plantation. That's really a pine plantation. It, it's a mixed stand with a lot of hardwood in it, a lot of sweet gum. Um, oaks and other species. Here's some 20-year-old uh, data, but it's still pretty comparable to what we're doing today. Between a quarter and a third of our applications are site prep applications before our crop trees are out there. And again, amazapir is going to be one of the main chemicals we use then. Um, herbaceous release is between a third and a half of our applications. So again, sulfmetron, oust, putting out in a spring post-planting application is very, very common. And then a woody release in the middle of the rotation. So we might use triclopyr for this if we've got a bad yopon problem mid-rotation. Remember, triclopyr is foliar in its activity. So if our pines are 50 feet tall and our yopon's 15 feet tall, we can drive a skitter through the stand, spraying triclopyr out, and it's getting it on the yopon foliage, but it's not getting it on the pine foliage because it's spraying it below. Same application with a helicopter over the top kills your pines too. So that skitter-based application mid-rotation uh, would be preferred. So here's, again, some of those somewhat outdated <laughs> uh, prescriptions. So post-planting over the top of seedlings, it's got Alstar listed there. That's the combination of Aust and Velpar. So it's a mixture of sulfmetron and hexazinone. That's no longer manufactured. So uh, the company that was producing that decided to quit making it. And uh, the companies selling herbicides are stockpiling what little of it is left because people still want it. It's a very effective product, but I guess there just wasn't a big enough market for us. Again, forestry is a pretty small market to the point they're not manufacturing that anymore. Of course, you, you could accomplish the same thing because you can still buy products that have sulmetron in them. You can still buy products that have hexazinone in them. So you could create your own tank mix that still affects that same thing. Um, Arsenal AC plus Oust XP, that's gonna be a Mazapir and sulfmetron. And then Alsta Extra is sulfmetron and metsulfuron. So you can see they all include <laughs> sulfmetron mixed with something else. And then the fall site prep tank mix, again, you can see it's different examples of sulfmetron there. Um, yeah, Chris. So you, you talked about like a skitter that goes in and, and does sort of talk about like, you know, mid rotation. Yeah. How does that work whenever it's like, I mean, obviously there's a lot of competition and there's a lot, so does it just kind of wind its way through? Does it wait till after a row thin and just down the roads? Yeah, you would wait till after a row thin um, because then you have access, which is important. You don't want it just winding through there. You want a uniform application. If it just winds through there, you're going to end up with areas applied over the rate and other areas that are applied under the rate. And applying over the rate is illegal because it's uh, regulated by the EPA. Like well, the fifth row thin is ideal these days because the way the sprayers are set up, they only spray a certain distance, right? And if you do a fifth row thin and you just drive down each down row, that will tend to give you pretty uniform spray over the whole site. Uh, you'll get, you know, the barely overlapping in the middle or maybe a two or three foot area that's not controlled in the middle between the second and third row left up, but you get pretty good control across the site. Now, if you had Yopon that's 15 feet tall, 
you might want to start prescribing like a third row thin because that spray just isn't going to make it into the middle because it sprays up and out. So for a taller competitor, it's not going to be as effective if you did a fifth row thin. So yeah, that, that's where your down row choice can play into it, whether you're going to do a, a mid rotation release operation, right? But yeah, so typically after a row thin, of course, if you've gone with the wider spacing, if you're on a five by 20 foot spacing, now you just need to decide, oh, I spray 40 feet each side. So I'm gonna go every other row and I'm gonna spray and get pretty uniform spray. Um, of course, with a skitter, they can control the speed uh, at which they go. Um, and that will also dictate how much they end up applying per acre. So. Okay, um, now there is a maximum rate you can apply but you can always legally apply anything under that rate, okay? But if you apply too low, it's not gonna be effective. You're not gonna get much control. And so you wanna apply at a target rate where your susceptible species are impacted. But more than that, it may not be legal if it's over the labeled rate and it just may not be necessary. You're wasting chemical. Keep in mind with all that we're talking about with competition control, we're not looking for perfectly clean sites. We are not attempting to kill every single weed out in these stands. What we're trying to do is just give us, you know, enough control that the pines have a good head start. You want a lot of that other vegetation out there to prevent erosion for wildlife. There's lots of other reasons we want that vegetation out there. You're just trying to make sure that the pines are dominant on that particular stand. Now, when you look at this, you've got species that are susceptible, species that will have marginal effect to an herbicide, and species that are resistant. What would you prefer that your crop trees are? You want your crop trees to be resistant. So we have that with the up here with loblolly pine. Um, but, you know, if you're trying to put in a food plot and you accidentally get a up here out in that area, you know, it's probably not a food plot for a few years, right? So you got to be careful there. Um, a up here may affect longleaf more than it affects loblolly. So after applying a up here, you may need to wait longer to plant longleaf. And then it, it varies by species. So metsulfuron, escort, works well with lava olive. Do not include it in a prescription for longleaf. Um, it'll damage longleaf. So you don't want metsulfuron in a prescription if you have longleaf that you're managing. So, you know, you need to know resistances and susceptibilities because that influences how effective these applications are. You only have certain application windows, right? Outside of which they're not effective. So Velpar on the left there in blue, you can see it hits peak efficacy in March, April. So remember is Velpar, that's hexazinone. Is it soil active or foliar active? If it's most effective out in mid-March. Foliar, yeah, sorry, soil active. Yes, it's soil active. If it was foliar, we just don't have enough leaves on things yet. So it doesn't make sense. And then right in the middle is a cord. That's glyphosate. It's most effective in July. Foliar active, right? And then we have Arsenal AC, that's a mazapir. So that's a soil active product that hits peak efficacy around August. Um, and so some of these soil active products can go out when there's also leaves out there as well. So Velpar is hexazinone. It's not a mixture. Alstar is a mixture of sulfametron and hexazinone. Velpar is just hexazinone. Um, so when you look here, you know, if, if you're going to apply arsenal, okay, which is that uh, gray line at the far right of here, you'd like to get all of it out, you know, in August or September. But is that realistic? The contractors may be spraying someone out somewhere else and say, we'll be out there in October. Um, if you're working for a big company, you may have 10,000 acres you need sprayed this year and the crew's sitting out there and you've got some windy days and they can't do anything. So it's going to take them a while to get to all 10,000 acres. They'll go as fast as they can when the conditions are right, but they may only get a couple hours on some days during which they can apply. So, um, so you know, you may be applying in October where efficacy is about half what it would be if you applied in August, September. So what can you do if you know your application is gonna be less effective? You could try to wait a year, but then you lose a year. What else could you do? Yeah, so you might be able to switch products up, go with a tank mix. So that's something you can consider. What else can you do if you still think Arsenal is your best choice, but you think it's gonna be less effective? Yeah, you could use some adjuvants that may help with efficacy. The other thing you could do is pretty straightforward, bump the rate up. If you're not applying at the maximum label rate, bump your rate up and apply more. Um, and so that may give you better control. It's less effective, but you put more of it out. So it sort of counters it out. 
Okay, here, here's a picture. Guess which side they used herbaceous weed control on. It's effective. So um, here's an example of a banded application to release pine from grass. So banded applications are good for wildlife because you leave cover and food potentially in between the planted rows. They're good at minimizing erosion if that's a concern. Um, and it's a lower chemical cost. Application cost may be the same or higher because you may need a, a crew out there doing this with backpacks. But So there's an example of a banded application. And you can see the pines are larger where the herbicide has been applied. This is a scenario very similar to what we saw in the Foshi North End stand where whether it was oust for some hardwood control, whether it was chopper and garland for yopon control, you've released your crop tree. That's what you're trying to do. Sometimes you unintentionally release another species that becomes your new weed. So here you're seeing a lot of goat weed that was released in these prescriptions accidentally. You may not have had much of it before applying and then oops, now you've got a lot of it. Um, so you gotta be careful not to accidentally create a new weed by releasing your crop and then one dominant weed. So that can happen sometimes. Um, here's a few different ideas where they didn't do anything on the left. You see a lot of herbaceous vegetation. There's an example of Alstar where it gave you some control and you see the pines with those pin flags. And then on the right, they used arsenal and oust extra. So that's three different active ingredients. And they got you pretty good control. Anecdotally, talking to some folks that do a lot of plantation establishment, you may not want that photo on the right. That's pretty good control, but look at all that bare soil. If we get into a hot, dry summer, those seedlings have no cover at all. They may be more likely to you know, succumb to drought mortality. Um, so we may not necessarily want that complete of control where it's just bare ground. It's really gonna you know, absorb that sunlight um, and get even hotter. Here's effective yopon control with five quarts of garlon. Now, realistically, that's very effective yopon control. Often we'll get less than that. You can see, you can't even see the torso of the person on the left. Uh, there's so much yopon in there. And so that's an example where, you know, you're gonna need a pretty high spray volume to get through all that yopon. Okay, here's uh, three graphs that come from a competition study that Miller did in the early 2000s. Um, this first graph is for four low hardwood sites where they only had five to 12 square feet per acre hardwood establishment. And what we're seeing on these four bars is what the stem volume is at age 15. So this is mid rotation where you may be looking at getting in there and doing a first stem. And again, remember hundred cubic feet is equal to three tons. So where they didn't apply any herbicide that bar on the far left, 2,700 cubic feet is about 81 tons per acre. That's a pretty good stand at age 15. So this is already a pretty good site. Um, 81 divided by 15, our MAI is over five tons per acre per year. So this is a very productive site, okay? Well, then they applied uh, herbicides to control woody vegetation in some of their plots and you got a 200 cubic foot uh, per acre per year growth response, about 192. So why didn't you get a big growth response there? These are low hardwood sites, okay? If you have one hardwood per acre and you kill it, is the stand very different after? No, so you got 100% control, but you, you fixed a very small problem. So you got a very small growth response. If you had a lot of hardwoods per acre, so you had a thousand hardwoods per acre and you apply treatment that kills 80% of them, that's a much less effective treatment from a percentage killed standpoint, but you're gonna get a much larger growth response because you did more to fix a much larger problem in that scenario. Okay, clearly herbaceous weeds were an issue there. You got three times the growth response from that treatment. So close to 600 cubic foot per acre um, over that 15 year period. And then the interaction is more than additive. 200 plus 600 should equal 800, but when they applied both, it equaled almost a thousand. And so that's what you wanna see ideally. So if you're writing a prescription for this stand and you wanna grow it as best as possible, what's your prescription? Use them both, right? But what information would you like to know before making that decision? Yeah, so which products? How about cost, right? So if you know the costs are such that you can only afford one of these, go with herbaceous weed control. If you can afford both, maybe you're applying both. Okay, so remember, 81 tons on the control plots. Here now we're getting about 60 tons on the control plots. So this stand has a mean annual increment uh, in the untreated plots of four tons per acre per year. So a less productive site um, and more hardwoods. 
So we went from five to 12 on up to 18 to 34 square feet for hardwoods per acre. And now the trend is reversed, right? Hardwoods are a problem. So our hardwood control is much more effective on these sites. And again, the interaction there is more than additive. So if you can only afford one treatment, hardwood control, if you can afford both, that gives you the best growth, best growth response. But if you look now with both added on here, we go from a mean annual income of about four tons per acre per year. Now we're producing about 3,200 um, cubic feet per acre. So that's going to be what, 96 tons per acre per year um, over a 15 year period. So we're doing pretty good. That's going to give us a mean annual increment over six. So we really bumped our MAI up six tons per acre per year. Okay, here's two shrubby sites, 13 times three um, there for the check plots, that's gonna get us up to about 40 tons per acre over a 15 year period. So now our mean annual increment is less than three tons per acre per year. So these shrubby sites were very unproductive. And again, we see an interaction that's more than additive. And so what you'll see is it more than doubles productivity. It takes you up to closer to five tons per acre per year if you apply both in terms of your mean annual increment. So on these sites, getting your herbicide prescription right, it's the difference between long rotations and low productivity or having a decent stand. If you looked at the low hardwood site here, even if you don't apply herbicides, you still have a decent stand here, okay? So it may be less important on this site to get it right than it is on this site, okay? It, it sort of makes or breaks your whole rotation there. Okay, I've already been talking about this, but most applications are done by helicopter, okay? Helicopters can uh, typically carry about 800 pounds of herbicide. Um, and so at eight pounds per gallon for water, that means they can carry about 100 gallons. And if they're applying about 15 gallons per acre, that means they can apply to about seven acres before they have to go fill the, the herbicide tank back up again. So most of our applications are by helicopter. Uh, we will see other broadcast applications with a skitter. Rarely you might see tractors or other modified ag equipment, but skitters are pretty common. They've got pretty sophisticated systems for skitters now, whereas the skitter sort of moves through the stand and ro rolls side to side, yaws back and forth. It adjusts the sprayers and everything. So you get a pretty uniform application. So they've got lots of good high tech stuff for this. We've got individual stem methods and there's some fancy equipment that you probably haven't seen out in the woods in the last maybe 40 years that basal injector, like a Jim Jim on the bottom left. No one's really using that anymore. Fancy hypo hatchets, things like that. Mostly it's just a hatchet and a spray bottle. Um, if you're applying a soil active chemical, you better be careful with this spray bottle. If it's got a leaky, you know, part on it and I'm walking through the woods and it's dripping as I'm walking around, um, you can be doing a lot of unintended control there. If this thing breaks, you probably want to have a second empty bottle with you so you can dump it in there. So you're not throwing a soil active herbicide like a mazip here all over your site. Um, so you want to be careful with that, uh, but pretty cheap, pretty effective there. Um, backpack sprayers are pretty common nowadays as well. So you could do a broadcast application in a small area um, with, with that backpack sprayer. Is that something you plan for in your uh, land monitoring with your yeah, with drift, you could you could put escrow accounts in, you could put in contract stipulations. I have seen cases where the foresters have gone out and marked the trees to be hacked and squirted, but that might be 500 trees an acre. So you're spending a lot of money marking them. You're going to each tree twice, once to paint it and once to hack and squirt it. So um, with these hack and squirt crews, it may be some training. Uh, these may be H2B workers. And so they've never taken dendro and, you know, may not know what our tree species are. Um, and so what we see operationally, if, if you go out and send a hack and squirt crew out to kill tallow, the bark on tallow is pretty similar to the bark on sweet gum. So you tend to find a lot of sweet gum getting hacked and squirted. Um, so you need to supervise closely and you may do that in part with contract stipulations. Yeah. So the individual stem methods in a mixed stand, they may be your only option because uh, you can't broadcast over a mixed stand because you would damage your crop tree. Um, the area methods are cheaper and more efficient. Uh, this, this is sort of a, a map from the GPS of a helicopter out spraying herbicides. And so you can see that area in the middle of the polygon. That's where the truck was, where they're going to refuel and where they're going to fill back up that herbicide tank. Sometimes they'll land flat out on the roof of these trucks. So these pilots are pretty gutsy. They're taking off and landing a bunch of times in a day. 
And then you can see on that blue shaded stand to the south, they flew mostly north and south. On the blue shaded stand up top, they flew mostly east and west. If you have a stream or an adjoining property that's not yours and you're, you're doing everything you can to avoid drift, you would rather them go parallel to that because then it's just one pass they have to get right. Whereas if they're going perpendicular to it, they have to cut off their nozzles right, you know, maybe 10 or 20 times each time. And if one of those times goes wrong, you know, you, you may end up getting drift and then the neighbor calls TDA and then TDA is out doing an investigation, lawyers get involved and it can get real expensive real fast. So. Okay, I've mentioned the labels a few times. The labels are not a suggestion. Um, it is the full force of federal law. Um, so it's illegal to apply any pesticide in a manner inconsistent with the label in the United States. Other countries will have different laws. The label's got a lot of good information. So you want to say stay safe. You want to keep your workers safe. So all the personal protective equipment, um, all that safety stuff is in there. So you make sure you read that carefully. Uh, but it'll tell you how to apply it. It'll tell you if it's even labeled for your situation or not. You look through a label and it'll say soybeans, rice, guava. And then it'll have, you know, conifers. And so it, it'll tell you exactly what scenarios you can apply it in. If, if your scenario is not in that label, it's illegal to apply that in that forestry application. So uh, sometimes it may be glyphosate, 41%. Three different products. Only one of them is legal to use in forestry. The other two aren't. Sometimes the products will be glyphosate, 41%. One of them is illegal to apply in a wetland. Another one is legal to apply in a wetland. Um, so you need to read those labels and make sure that you can apply that chemical. There will be signal words on them dictating the danger. Okay, if you get a signal word of danger, uh, if it has a skull and crossbones on it, it's a poison. A drop could kill an adult. So you need to be really careful with those and ideally maybe find a different chemical that'll do the same thing, just so you don't have that human safety risk there. Fortunately, the, the worst of those six chemicals we looked at was triclopyr with a warning level. So you have to drink a tablespoon a teaspoonful to a tablespoonful. So when's the last time you accidentally ingested a teaspoon to a tablespoonful of bleach or gasoline or table salt? I mean, you know, if you are using common sense precautions, that's not going to happen. And then caution, an ounce to a pint. You know, if you're not drinking a pint of gas, don't, you know, drink a pint of an herbicide. So read the label before you buy it so you get the right product before you mix it because that's when you're most likely to come in contact with the active ingredient yourself from a safety standpoint before you apply it to apply legally and before you store it or dispose of it. That's going to be important. So read the label. They're boring. They're detailed, but they're important. Here's how toxic those chemicals are. So again, glyphosate, amazapir, sulfmetron, sulfuron. If you wouldn't do something with diesel oil, don't do it with those chemicals, okay, from a safety standpoint. Hexazinone is up there with uh, aspirin and bleach, and triclopyr is up there with malathion and caffeine. Remember, any chemical is toxic to us at the right dosage. If you drink too much water, you can kill yourself. So literally any chemical can be toxic at too high dose. The most toxic substance on this list is botulinus toxin. And there's people injecting it in their faces, right? That's Botox. So the dose makes the poison. We've selected all these chemicals so that they do not persist in the environment, right? We had DDT uh, bioaccumulating and causing issues for birds. Um, and that caused a big backlash against herbicides. So now products like glyphosate, they're broken down into harmless salts in the soils. So these six chemicals are not the most effective chemicals. They're designed intentionally to be somewhat ineffective so they do not persist in the environment. Here's the half-life of glyphosate in the soil, 47 days. A month and a half, half of it is gone. Another month and a half, another half of it is gone. And so it breaks down to very low levels reasonably quickly. Um, in colder climates, it'll break down more slowly. In warmer climates, it'll break down more rapidly. So we've selected these chemicals so they won't do a lot of adverse environmental damage. And so here's, you know, just one final slide. You can go look up any label you want before you buy the product on that link at the CDMS database for free. You can get the MSDS sheets for all these too if Colhavy asks you for those. So, um, and then use common sense. When are the weeds? There's about a six week rule of thumb. We talked about that in the lab. So if you burn, wait six weeks to spray so things green back up. If you spray, wait six weeks to burn so that everything dies and dries out and the fire will carry. If you spray, or sorry, if you do a clear cut, wait six weeks to spray so things can green back up after you've cut everything. 
okay? So you're waiting six weeks between a lot of these. If you do mechanical site prep, wait six weeks to spray. And so that means it's hard to get everything in if you clear cut a stand after July 1. If a stand is clear cut after July 1, you may not get it planted that winter. So just be aware of that. So uh, again, lab this afternoon, we'll be out doing an herbicide prescription for silver. Thank <laughs> you.